everyone. Welcome to Simply Skating, no title required. This is Zof with my awesome co-host, Lucas. I'm going to do tech girl stuff while Lucas takes it away. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode two of season three of Simply Skating. Uh, happy to be back. Sorry I was sick for the last one, but it was it was pretty bad. Um, so totally happy to be back. So before we get to tonight's guest, Let's talk a little bit about the mission statement. Now, here we are in season three, and we really need you to reach out because tonight's guest is because somebody reached out to us. So we're really looking forward to it. But if you have somebody that you think would be great for the show, here's the only criteria. They have to be somebody who you think is a great example of what a regular person doing it in the SCA is like. All right. Um, again, we love our folks um, who are peers, who've achieved greatness uh, over their time in the SCA. But a lot of people listen to those people. And there's a lot of voices in the SCA that we could really benefit from hearing. People who are trying to get to their peerage, or maybe they're just happy playing the game uh, at their level. So if you know somebody like that, if you're somebody like that, reach out to us, all kingdoms, okay? We want to we want to touch all over the SCA, so the more the merrier. Reach out to us uh, via our Facebook page. Uh, there's a little survey there you fill out for the person or you could just drop us a message and say hey so and so would be a great guest and here's what they do and we're really looking forward to hearing from you but we're really looking forward to hearing from tonight's guest so uh as i bring up my notes which have timed nice out segue that was a beautiful segue did you like did you like that you like that i almost feel like i've done this a time or two at this point you know um the fact that you brought attention to it though makes me feel really good um so tonight uh, we are going to talk to Lord Ragnar Blisskeg. Uh, he is. Uh, oh, I'm going to do it wrong. Now I'm going to. I'm going to balk. Um, Varangian. I think I got that. Varangian guard uh, Viking from the 11th century. He's a blacksmith, warrior, researcher, and bringer of pizza to all. And I, I definitely want that story. Uh, Ragnar works hard to bring fun and energy to everything he does. If that is fighting the battlefields of Penzig. Or, or washing dishes in the kitchen. So he's currently resides in the canton of Broken Bridge in the Crown Province of Oscar. Ragnar's been a member of the SA for almost 10 years, not planning on slowing down. Ragnar, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here tonight. So again, we're going to start the way we always start. It, 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 we, we stumbled on our, our formula. Um, and, and I think a lot of people like hearing this. Um, how did you find the SCA? So... Almost, <laughs> a little serendipitous. So uh, about 10 years ago, uh, my wife and I were doing uh, American Rev War reenacting. And we had just decided to really slow down with that um, for a variety of reasons. One, Red Wool in the middle of winter is not fun because we were British reenactors. <laughs> um, and uh, but we, we were looking for something else. And we happened to be um, in the Pittsburgh area. And we saw a car going down, uh, was it 79 there, uh, going to Penzik. And with all of this, and there were like bumper stickers that said the SCA. It was like, I think one of them was like Penzik or bust. And we we're like, what's going on? And then we turned this corner and they're all the sea of tents. And we're like, what is this? And we, we almost got into an accident <laughs> just being so shocked. Seeing all of the tents that were laid out. Uh, at Penzik and um, we were there for a wedding. So we, we went to the wedding, um, but really it was the talk of, for, for, uh, for both of us about what was going on. Um, and we learned about the SCA that way. We learned it because we saw Penzik for the first time and we're like, we have to find this out. And we, when we came back um, to New York city, uh, we lived in, we live in Brooklyn and uh, we, we were like, all right, let's start, looking into this let's start seeing if there's like a local chapter and we started going to the ans nights that um uh the that usgard was hosting and we i've met friends now that i've had for close to 10 years there at that first ans night so it it was it was great and that's how i first found about the sea how did you decide on your persona oh uh so we we both love Vikings, uh, and we were both looking at that. Uh, so the, one of the things that really um, struck me about the Varengian Guard is 
that they are a group of um, Scandinavians and some Anglo-Saxons who started working for the Byzantine Empire. Empire, and I really like the the multicultural aspect of that of of saying like, I mean, we all we all you know know the 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 kind of stereotypes of Vikings, which is you know rightfully earned at some points of them going in invading places and and attacking, and you know that's what we all hear about. And to read about a group that's like going down and working with the Byzantines that are, are around the Middle East, you know, here looking at stories of there's still graffiti in mosques of like Dave was here basically uh, because they're like watching out while, while services are going on, you know, being guards and they're bored. So they're graffitiing up the like areas that they're in just seemed really cool to me and uh, has been like kind of an area of interest of like reading about them and, and, and learning about them. So that's why I like to, make my persona more of the Vrengen guard than just a, a standard Viking. And also like the, 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 the movement of the Vikings through Eastern Europe. So as they're the Rus and the other, you know, um, uh, uh, groups that, that, that start showing up in Eastern Europe is really interesting to me. So, so I kind of like, I, I gravitate more to that piece of the, the Viking history than some of the others. Cool. Now, again, you, you said you started attending ANS events. That's, mm -hmm. That's very different than, than I, a vast majority of our guests who seem to come to the SCA through fighting. Now, what kind of SCA, what kind of uh, ANS events were you doing? What kind of um, you know scholarship were they working on? So at the time when they when they were doing this, it was mainly like fiber art ANS, but it was a way to like mingle and get to know people. I I uh, I'll, I'll I'll say I've never been very good um, with needle and thread. But I respect it a lot, and I like hanging out with everyone and seeing what they're doing. I I eventually have found my ANS hobby, which has been blacksmithing, uh, which has been amazing. I I've um, really got to meet some amazing blacksmiths here in the East Kingdom and helped uh, to be one of the founding members of the um, uh, the East Kingdom Royal Blacksmith Guild. Um, and but like that first that first time, so so it was the first it was the first event that. When we came back, it was the it was the nearest event that was going on was the ANS night, and this was even before we even really knew about the fighting. Like I was really introduced first to all the 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 art people that were in the area, and it got me wanting to learn more. And actually, what I started doing first um, after that wasn't fighting; it was archery, um, and I met a lot of great people in the archery community. Um, and that, the, and it's from archery that led me down the road to um, fighting because I went to my first real event and I got to see fighting for the first time. And that event was uh, uh, the Feast of John Barleycorn. Uh, and I got to see uh, like the tournament style for the first time. And I was like, wow, I really want to do that. And it took a, a few years to like really feel confident to start doing it. And then I... Uh, got into it and it's within the since the pandemic it's within the last uh couple of years that i've really gotten a lot more serious with fighting so it's that that's been a major focus of mine um but i'm also really trying to revive the the um ans scene in in Uskard because of the pandemic it's been really hard to have these gatherings and we're really trying to restart gatherings and stuff and getting ans back together um here here in our in my area that's got to be harder now because they're saying we're going to have another COVID surge this this winter. Yeah, yeah, it's it's you know it's it's one of, one of the things that I I I think is um, going to really help the SCA in the long run is we've all learned kind of what you're all doing here tonight um, of of now we're all get, starting to get this virtual background of like how do we run these things virtually and I think that's what's going to help us especially during long winters where like there's more surges or things that are going on. I think keeping those lessons that we've learned um, and applying them to our gatherings and being able to be flexible to go from in-person to virtual is what's going to help us like continue to grow and, and, and get new members and keep it interesting for everyone. Cause it also makes sure that we are staying connected and at least doing something. I mean, it's doing something is better than just hanging around your house and, you know, doing your your crafts alone and kind of wishing like man i wish i was with my friends and talking about all this because like it's it's cooler when you're around a bunch of people or and even if it's just virtual it still feels a lot better than doing it alone okay so let's let's start with your interest uh, um was blacksmithing you brought 
something you brought with you from the Revolutionary War reenactment, or did you find that in the SCA and kind of get into it that way? I, I found it in the SCA. So I, I'd been looking for kind of my arts and science for a while. Like I had done some leather working. I had done um some other i i I tried sewing and i just was not a fan of sewing uh and i was really looking forward to it and i i met um a a person named brander uh who's who also lives here in in broken bridge and he's a blacksmith and he was like come by my place and try it out and i was like okay i'll come over and try it out and i was like wow fire and hitting things uh this seems like a great um you know this is a mishup of like two great things uh and so i i started working with him for a long time uh uh to because he now has his own business so i would help him with a lot of things and it really got me into it and um it i'm at the point that my the garage that i have uh is now basically my blacksmith forge i've cleared out a lot of it i have my own forge in there i've I've just this past penzik bought a 170 pound anvil to replace my poor 40 pound anvil so uh you know i'm upgrading <laughs> that was that was a car ride home i'll tell you to to <laughs> lift that into my car and somehow be like all right how do i get all of my pensic gear around this anvil so i can get it home and my wife is just like you figure it out <laughs> <laughs> i i helped you get this but you figure out how to get this in the car <laughs> um but it it was it, it it's been um uh, like i i love taking either just like a, a a piece of scrap metal or um even something like a process bar and being able to turn into something a lot of what i've what i've done um has been uh doing uh kitchen work hook work um and other uh uh, uh furniture work but i i've really started to go into uh blades recently so it's been really interesting like kind of making blades and kind of learning that whole lot because that's it i wouldn't have thought it was a different skill set but there are there there is a whole science around it that i that i'm trying to learn and get better at um and it's been uh it's going to be a journey i know it's going to be a journey of, of many years before i'm as good as some of the other people that i've met along the way but it's been fun so it's a blast to learn and um to you know just to heat things up i'll tell you what and now that winter's coming i'm a lot happier <laughs> to be out at my forge when i'm like in front of this thing that heating up a piece of metal to about like 2000 degrees so wow yeah so, so how far, did... no major burns i will say i have not majorly burned myself knock on wood <laughs> knock, knock on wood. wood i'm sure other blacksmith who may be listening to me be like Ha! He's not been baptized <laughs> yet by the fire, and I'm like, yes, I'm gonna keep trying to avoid that for as long as I can. <laughs> so, how did the Royal Blacksmithing Guild come into being? So, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, Brander, who I'd been uh, working with and under, uh, really wanted to elevate blacksmiths up a bunch, and he had worked with. Um, a bunch of the uh, the, the East uh, the East Kingdom Royals to set up um, uh, kind of uh, their our own guild because we'd seen like what the Brewers Guild had been doing and some of the other guilds had been doing and we really wanted to make a space for blacksmiths to uh, learn and have a resource to to learn in the kingdom and we're we're just getting off the ground I mean the 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 we we started a little bit before the pandemic then the pandemic happened and it slowed a lot of things down. I think we had a really good showing at Penzik where we could really get things going again. And I'm really hoping that in the next uh, few months to a year that we're really like doing everything that we're hoping to do, which is being that like knowledge base, that resource for blacksmiths to come to, to ask questions, to show off what they're making and like to have a goal, to have a system of like progressing so that you can show. Cause like everyone loves, you know everyone loves video games everyone loves like the progression tree that you can go up so like being able to provide that progression tree for people to say like oh uh all right my first project can be uh just some hinges or a spoon and then to move up to say all right now i'm going to uh really kind of remake this whole um you know uh, like a whole knife or a sword at some point um to really give people a progression of that really um can help people move along and also it helps to then 
uh, when people are at ANS competitions um, to give them the tools to talk about their um, pieces because sometimes it's hard being in a in a, an arts and science that's not as as heavily represented as some of the others it's hard you know to be judged by others so like to give people tools of how to properly explain yourselves and to really show off and um one of the things that i love doing is researching pieces um my last uh, uh major project was a weird um viking relic called the wrangle which was this like um i don't i wish i had it around me i don't know where it is right now but it's basically this uh uh weird ring system that they would put onto their horse carts or may have it in their hand and some of the research that i saw was mainly like oh they may have used it for um uh uh noises noise detection so you knew when like a horse cart was coming along but then it later evolved into more of maybe a ritual system um maybe for funerals of people who were like uh, majorly into horses or something uh so like to, to i like researching the weird pieces of like viking history um so the other thing that i may be looking into uh is uh i've been reading a lot about viking medicine women and the implements that they used for their rituals and and one of the uh things that they use are uh metal wands so like how other groups would have like wooden wands or something the vikings <clears throat> for a lot of their 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 medicine women would have like these metal ornate wands that I really want to try to recreate something like that. So um it may take quite a bit of work uh because some of them were quite ornate, but it's it it'll be interesting to kind of um progress on that and try to learn until I feel like I have a piece that I really want to show off to people. Have you competed ANS with any of your pieces or yeah the the wrangle I've I've competed. I did a Kings and Queens ANS in, in 2019. Um <laughs> <clears throat> one second um i wanted to do um something in like this year but i didn't feel quite ready um i've gotten into metal casting so melting metal and then casting it into different forms uh and i've actually been researching chess a lot and um i've been finding out that the chinese actually uh had um uh, metal cast pieces for their chess sets so i'm learning a little bit about the, the Chinese variant of chess in, I think it's the pieces I've seen in are been in the eighth century. And I want to, I'm doing, I still need to do some research about what the board looked like. And I want to try to recreate an eighth century um, China um, uh, 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 chess board. Um, the pieces are more, they have characters on them from what I've seen um, instead of being like what we think in, in European history, which is like, the knight or the rook and they're you know in 3d these are more of like that they're that they're more coins with uh symbols at least what i've seen but so i'm doing a little bit more research about that um and that's what i'm hoping to do for maybe next year's um uh kings and queens ans here in the east kingdom uh is to make this like make an ornate like chess board with all these chess pieces um really stylized after uh the this this these pieces that i've been finding that have been found in eighth century china so what do we know about blacksmithing, for example, in China versus in, in England, right? So what are the differences in the blacksmithing styles they used, or are there any? Um, there, there are a few, because um, so it, it really depends on what materials you're finding in, in those areas. So like you, you see like uh, everyone talks about how, at least um, from my limited research on, on some of it, how um, the Vikings had really good material were close to steel for a lot of their pieces because of the material that they were using was so heavy in carbon um that they were able to really get close to steel um but for the mo for the majority of europe um they're really just using iron and it's just iron whereas you'll start to see in in, in china and in india they get closer to steel and actually can um it, for a lot of the research that i've been doing with casting um, they've been they were learning how to melt down metals and cast it into what they want way sooner than the Europeans were doing. Um, from what I've seen so far, Europeans weren't like learning how to cast things until maybe the 1600s or 1700s. Whereas like I believe I was reading India was casting things the way they wanted in like the 580 area era. So like you 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 see like a lot of these techniques that europeans start to learn has already been like been in use 
in a lot of the the Asian and Middle Eastern areas because they're they're um not going through the dark ages that Europe had gone through. So they're they're a little bit more advanced on a lot of these things. And you don't see like a European explosion of technology until they start going over there um and and learning more about what they could do about all that, whether it be from just uh you know going through the Crusades or through just immigration. You know, once they're in the Crusades and they're like, well I don't really want to be in the army, go off, learn and then bring it back to their homeland. So you you start to see a little bit of an explosion there. So in your exploration of blacksmithing, again, you had the most succinct uh, description of what blacksmithing is. Oh, it's fire and I get to hit things like <laughs> that. And, and to anybody that doesn't do it, that's probably the most significant features of it. In your learning how to do it, what was that like, oh, like aha moment or like, like you don't see that. Every time somebody shows blacksmithing, it literally is just hitting that iron you know, red hot iron and sparks and whatnot. But obviously that's not the only part of the process. What what was that part of the process that you learned that like totally changed your perspective on, on smithing? Uh, it was it, one of the people that I, I was, I was working with her. Her name was Ron Vey. She, she's an artist and she was like, you have to think of it like a clay. And she literally took some clay and started beating it and like move the clay to, to the way that she wanted. And then she was like, look, when you hit up, heat this up, it moves kind of like the clay, you know, you have to hit it more, but like it moves the way that you want it to. And that like really clicked for me when you start to think once you've heated up metal enough that it's starting to move almost like a clay like material, it it really like opened my mind. I, I also, you get to a moment where you're like the, you, you get this idea when you're, when you're doing blacks, when you're seeing blacksmiths that you have to hit things with like all the power that you have. And I've been told at points it's like, man, it's like having your own power hammer when I when like people used to see me early on like hitting things. <laughs> and um and that's how you just damage the material that you have. Like and and it's and it, it it you when you get to a heat, like yes, you have to put some like power into it, but like there is a finesse to it that you need to to learn and and be ready to do um that takes that took me a long time to and still taking me a long time to really learn and master uh because it's not about power it is, it is really about learning how the metal moves and how to uh manipulate it in ways that it will go into the shape that you want it to um i i've seen some people be absolutely masterful with this and i really hope to emulate them one day all right so shout out to your wife um your wife what's her name uh arnora arnora um yeah. does arnora get to wear any of the things that you've made uh she's uh i've, I've made her keychains so she's had keychains she's nice. she's had hooks um i uh have made uh i don't think i've made her a couple of medallions i'm actually starting to do some etching work so uh possibly for christmas she might be getting something so uh i i've, I've been she learning how to tell yeah, don't. Sh- um, <laughs> I, I've been learning how to etch things with uh, some some different acids to make some cool stuff. So um, I may I may be looking to do some of that. So uh, uh, that 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 may be more much more of the flashy work that I'll be doing. But she primarily, I'm the one who gets to wear most. Like the coat that I'm wearing tonight, she made. So she primarily makes a lot of the stuff we wear because she is an amazing uh, seamstress. Nice. Well, to do Rev War, she'd have to be because they're so particular about what everybody wears, aren't they? Oh, she made both when we because uh, she really wanted to be a a, a Brit. So uh, her father is English. So when we were doing Rev War, she really wanted to be a, a British um, a soldier. And so we found a unit that actually let women fight um, in the unit. Um, and uh, uh, she made both of our coats and they were they were amazing. So to, to get that together and look uh, good on the field, I, I really credit her for that. I kind of miss that code in the winter sometimes. <laughs> I, I have a question kind of a little off topic about Rev War. You, you, say, you say fight. Now, obviously, an SCA battle is, you know, you know rattan and, and, mm-hmm. and really, you know, going. Rev War fighting, is what, how, how is that accomplished? So you... There, there, there is a little bit of a script sometimes with it. Um, sometimes they'll just say, "Oh, just light up and like shoot a few volleys, 
some people go, you know, march forward. Some people march back. Just make it look good. And, um, you know, every so often uh, they'll, they'll say, all right, um, uh, attach your bayonets and let's just charge. And, and you know, once we're all out of our, our uh, cartridges, because the, the way that it works with the, with the black powder rifles, um, you actually do have like a, a cartridge box and you're, you have these little paper cartridges that you have to make yourself mm-hmm. full of black powder. And uh, I remember the taste of black powder because you have to rip that cartridge with your teeth and like get it in. So you get some of that in your mouth um, and then you're firing this over and over. So your gun's getting super hot. But um, there'll, there'll be times when, um, you know, we'll be at a battle and there'll be a script and uh, the sergeant will have to make calls of like, all right, I need someone to pretend to die or, you know, something. Uh, and, or other times of, of calling us to march forward to have the other side move back and forth, depending on what's going on. Or we just make it look good. I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of acting there. Um, I remember one time uh, I, I was tasked to, uh, I forget what the battle was, but to run up and try to steal the American flag. Uh, and had all the Americans run around me and just start firing, uh, and that was that was a little cool. Um, and luckily, it was at a safe distance, so I didn't have to get burned. But it was kind of fun to have the crowd booing me as the heel. <laughs> nice, yeah. You know, I did some family research. I know this isn't about me, but I'm making this moment about me. So I did some family research. My one quarter of my family came over in the late 1600s, and my great 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 whatever uncle was a dragoon a british mm-hmm. dragoon which i was like wow his nickname was mad captain sprouts <laughs> so i don't know what you have to do in the british dragoons to or- earn the nickname mad captain but this man did it I, I can tell you what it probably was not shaving because the british regulation <sighs> manual said that you had to be clean shaven and that was one of the reasons why I was like, I don't know how if I could do this too much because I love my beard. Uh, so my last name, Bliskeg, is actually a Old Norse word that supposedly means black beard. That's why I took it. Um, uh... Although there's some gray starting to come in like, right well, here. That, that comes with children too. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, my, my son uh, it definitely has given me some gray hairs. Um, but a lot of love, but some gray hairs. Um, but yeah, I, when, when I, I, I had shaved a few times for events, uh, especially when it was like the major, like, uh, battles where they're like, we want everyone to be on book and I had to shave my beard and I just was not super thrilled with it. Cause I really like having a beard. I'm nice. sure most of the people in the SCA have never seen me without a beard because once I was in, I was like, well, I'm not shaving my beard anymore. So we have to ask the pizza question. Let's get to the pizza. Okay, question. the pizza. So, the what's pizza. up with the pizza? So, the, the pizza question comes from from last Penzik, uh, where we it's it's I believe the the Thursday or Friday before we're all leaving, we're all tired and we decided to to order pizza and we ordered the pizza from John's Pizzeria over there near Penzik, um, and we didn't know, uh, uh, being being New Yorkers. We thought, oh, we'll order a large pie and, you know, we'll get like, um, uh, you know, four large pies and it'll just be four boxes. Uh, we didn't quite know that John's Pizzeria separates the larges into separate boxes. So, like, I'm carrying like these eight giant boxes down to our camp. And there's I think one of the photos that I gave you uh, was is just me carrying all these boxes and everyone just cheering as they're like, yes, pizza, because it took, uh, you know, because everyone's ordering pizza that night. So it took forever for pizza to come. And I'm just coming into camp and all the kids are like, pizza! And like, (laughs) screaming for pizza. My son is like, going nuts. Because my son has a love for pizza that is otherworldly. And I think he would sell me and my wife in order to get a pepperoni slice. Yeah, that doesn't stop minus 16. And he would still probably do the same thing for (laughs) a slice of pepperoni pizza. That's on brand. That's on brand. Yeah. Um, So... What are your, if you have any, aspirations in the SCA? Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, ooh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, my 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 goals right now is I, I want to become a, a better blacksmith and a better fighter. So, um, and, and, and a lot of it is also then working with um, the New York City chapter to help it grow. So um, when I, when I first started in the SCA, the, the, um new york city chapter was doing okay and it's been really like growing but like 
the the SCA chapter that's here is in the middle of one of the largest groups of humans on earth and we should be able to figure out how to how to better market ourselves and get you know one of the largest you know groups of uh membership roles in the SCA and but it's not something that we've done so what I really want to see is the for the New York City chapter to grow and go to new events that we wouldn't be a part of before like we we just were part of something called the king's county fiber festival we'd never done that before and it was an amazing demo for us we 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 demoed fiber arts for the first time and we got buzz that we never got before and i really want to see that like happen you know really for the group and i really want to be a part of really helping it grow um and then for me personally i really just want to um so I my my aspirations are I I starting probably next year I'm going to try to fight in Crown Tourney, and I really want to um uh, it, I I don't I I want to win but I want to be happy with my performance I think that's that's what I want I want to be able to go in and be like and come away and be like I am happy with my performance at a Crown Tournament and I think that's what I really want to aim for I know that seems like a low mark but I I. Um, something that I've been told and and has really resonated with me. If you just look at the grand scre- scheme of things, it's going to like trigger your anxiety and like you know me- mess you up, especially when you're going into a tournament. Um, whereas if you just look at it as like just do it one fight at a time and then grow and then and then grow on that, it's going to help you so much more. So for me, it's just one fight at a time. I want to go to a uh, to something and say, all right, I want to win that first round. I want to win that second round. I want to win that that third round and say, all right, I am happy with my performance. I got to that fourth round and I am, I am, I am super, I didn't win that fourth round, but I am super happy with that. Um, I just had one of my best showings in the tournament uh, like three weeks ago. And I, uh, I, I went um, four or five uh, wins. I forget which. And it was, it, it, I was so, I was so like pumped about that, that I was like, all right, this is, I need to work on this. So to say that, and then also to say that I, I can win a major tournament of some sort is where I want to be in the next five years. So that I, that I've, you know, no matter what the, the recognition is, it, it is all about what I can feel like I'm doing, you know, with myself and can I better myself? Cause it's also been a great physical education journey for me. Like I, when I, when I came into the SCA, um, I was over like 300 pounds. I I'm now at about 260. Um, I've gone down to 250 at a point. Um, I probably could get lower if I really apply myself, but like, it's really been like a great physical journey for me, like a physical fitness journey. Um, and both the hobbies that I have are physical fitness journeys. And so it's really been great to, you know, go along with those and, and, and better myself. Like I've really seen a betterment of myself, um, going through this. And I really want to continue that in the next five years and really feel like that I, because I'll I, at that point I'll be over forty, and to say that I'm still at a, a competitive nature and that I'm in a better physical fitness like rank than I was when I was thirty is something that I'm really want to aim for. And what about? And I'm sorry, Lucas. Um, one more question. So, what about entering A and S? Are you? Do you have the goal of being A and S champion? I I would love to be A and S champion. I'm hope I'm hoping so. Like I'm hoping I'm really hoping that the the chess set that I'm really planning for if I can have it finished for, for next year, um, will wow people. Like I, I, I have this, I, I have this thought that I'm going to not just like, I'm, I'm experimenting with pewter. I'm experimenting with copper and like some other materials. And I really want to make something that's really flashy. And I'm hoping that to really, maybe not next year, but in the next couple of years, really be uh, the ANS champion for these. Cause I really think I, I have like a really cool idea that may wow people and to have the research for it. So um, cause I've, I've got, I've really gone down some rabbit holes of looking at, at chess sets. And, um, I, I, I'm really sorry that like, I can't find more European chess sets that are made out of metal because they just weren't doing that. Everything's made out of, um, from what I can find uh, bone or ivory. And I'm like, uh, I don't really want to carve bone, really don't want to carve bone. So I really want to keep, try to keep it the metal. That's cool. All right, Lucas. Uh, I mean, uh, so, so obviously you sound like you really love tournaments. Um, you, you talked about the battlefields of Benzik. Do mm-hmm. you prefer battles or do you prefer tourneys where it's just kind of on you? Uh, before this Penzik, I would have said it was um, uh, tournaments, that I preferred tournaments. Uh, this Penzik, 
I really got to fight with uh so the the New York City scene has really had a lot of fighters come up recently and it was the first time that I really got to fight with uh, a cohesive unit from New York City and our our Uskard unit like really like fought well together and it was a blast. It was a blast to be with like everyone that was there um and it 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 honestly made it one of the best Penzik melees that I've ever been to to be with them. Uh, I got to uh, out of um, I only had to miss one of the battles, but all the battles I got to fight in with everyone that has been going to the the practice that we have uh, here in Brooklyn has been amazing. So I'm really looking forward to next Penzik when we're even better and really showing off. So, I mean, it was it, it this year was a great year. What's um, your fa- what's your favorite Penzik battle? Uh, so normally it was the Woods battle. I had to miss it this year, unfortunately. Um, but the, the second favorite battle they had was the town battle that they, that we set up this year. Um, the town battle was fantastic. Uh, and there was a point that I, I'm alone with my, my, my brother, Albrick, who, um, he, he's the one who made the design back here. He's, he's a great designer. Uh, we're, we're alone and there's this like group of people and we square off against this guy and, um, he takes my leg, but I, I get him in the head and he walks off and the rest of the guys are like, do you know who that was? And it's like, I don't know who that was. And you're like, that was the king of Drakenwall and we're going to kill you. And I was like, oh no. And they surround me and I'm like on my knees, just like holding them off for a while. And I was like, wow, this is the best Pensick that I've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm actually glad you brought up your background. I'm going to shout somebody out who's in the chat. Um, Narana. Yeah. That's Cantrell. Right. That's my way. Yeah. Okay. Because she she mentioned the she mentioned the background. Okay. Yeah. So I I don't know if that was the, you know her kind of poking the bear a little bit, knowing knowing where that was coming from or, or whatnot. But uh, when people throw stuff up in the chat, hey, hi, how are you? She, she said <laughs> hi. Um. So so I'm glad you brought you brought up the background. Um. So um. Research wise, because again, we're trying to hit hit all your things. Um, I mean, I think you've talked a lot about research tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, where I mean, so it sounds like the, the, the focus right now is the chess set. Mm-hmm. Um, but where did you kind of come in on research? Was it your persona? Was that where you started with research? Like I, and everything I, kind of branched from there? Or? I think it was the persona. I think it was also the 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 first Kings and Queens A and S um, uh, competition that I went to, where I really wanted to. Uh, from from what I've seen, not a lot of um, like I really wanted to show off like what a blacksmith could do with something that was weird. Going in with something that was kind of an esoteric, kind of weird artifact that no one had ever heard of, I really wanted to show that like I had really good research. So um, for anyone who's in the chat, if you look up my entry, my my East Kingdom wiki page, um, you could actually see my I have my research linked if you want to look up the Viking Wrangle. Um, uh, but to like go through and find this like weird esoteric like object that you know may have been used as like a just like a noise device or even like a, a, a piece of worship I was like all right now let me try to recreate that um, and then like it's just gone from there like the chess sets what I'm focusing on now but like I really like kind of the weird esoteric like just this nature of history and researching it um, and trying to recreate those objects like I, there, there's kind of like a magical nature about them that I really like and, and really um, can really feel when I, when I get to go work on it, work hands on with it. I guess that's like a weird thing about being a blacksmith and working with fire. The, you, you almost kind of envision the fire as like your actual magical power, like developing what you're making. Um, and, and then, and then, you know, giving it, giving it li- a life of its own. Um, for our uh, viewers who don't know, who are not from the East Kingdom, the East Kingdom Wiki is East Kingdom Wikipedia. It's a um, the wiki is where the populace of the East Kingdom can have pages, bio pages, basically all about them. So if you go to the East Kingdom website and you can find that by just typing East Kingdom, I've always just do that. I don't have it memorized. Sorry. Um, and you can see the wiki and you can look up Ragnar's information. Go ahead. Lucas, I know you're dying to ask another question. I'm kind of blanking on what it was for a second there. Yeah, um, I, I threw him off. I win. Yeah, yeah. no, it's fine. You win um, tonight. Oh, no, and I can't remember what it was. 
Oh, for like, and I, it's funny because I usually write everything down. I know I you do. That's and why I, I thought I could down. interrupt you because you always write things down. And I didn't. I didn't write it down. Um, it was a oh so all right so if I let again a lot of our viewers um you know you you think fiber arts or or, or things like that it it people know where to start with that mm-hmm. where where do you start with blacksmithing I mean do you have to find somebody who already knows how to do it or are there resources that people can start going to to kind of start their own I I that's a good question so like for me it was meeting someone who got me into it. And I think that is, I think that there's a little bit of that, of like meeting people <coughs> who are already in it to, to help you along. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a heavy investment to just get into. I mean, if you watch uh, the, the history channel is a great competition called Forge and fire. And they say at the start of Forge and fire, which is a competition of blacksmiths, um, you know, don't try this at home. Uh, and, you know, there's a little bit about that, but I, I think that's one of the goals that we really want with the, with the East kingdom blacksmith guild of like being that, like, that like place that someone can go and be like, Oh, I want to start this. How do I get into it? Well, talk to us. We can at least like get you in with someone who may want to help you get started um, and really help you along with that journey. Uh, Because I I think that is like the best way to get into blacksmithing is to meet another blacksmith who is really excited about doing this and really excited about showing you how to hit stuff um, and to make really cool stuff. So it, 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 I, I would love to say like, oh, you can do the research on your own and get into it. And I'm sure people do it. But I think for a vast majority of people to really get into this hobby is to meet someone who already has their own forge and maybe borrow time on their forge to do your own projects and start to learn. How many blacksmiths are in the guild? Um, So we have the five founding members. And then we have, I believe, uh. 30 or 40 members who are on our role. It, it may be a, like a less than that, but it, it's, it's around that of people who have like signed up to do things. And, um, uh, but then people who have actually like gone up the ranks, I believe it's about 10 or so who have like, actually we we've started to like go through their projects and do that. So probably like, probably like 10 people who have actually like put projects together um with a, a bunch more who are kind of like hanging on and like talking to us and stuff so that's so cool how yeah. how far reaching is the membership uh we have people up in uh the northern region um so up in uh i think there's one person in in, in uh i want to say there's one in canada uh but there's a lot in in vermont and maine vermont and maine have a lot of blacksmiths fritz um, Master Fritz, he's a good mm-hmm. friend. Um, and then uh, uh, down here, uh, I, I, there's myself and Brander who are down here um, in in Broken Bridge, and there's a few in Jersey that I know of. Um, there's a uh, 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 Master Jamie who is out in um, uh, 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 Connecticut, I believe, who owns an amazing forge. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so there, there's. There's quite a few people all around the, the East Kingdom. So have you ever thought about trying to make a living or a side living doing your blacksmithing? I, you know, I, I've thought about it. I, uh, the, the, the hustle that I see some of the others do, uh, I, I think I love it more as like a hobby um, than actually making a profession. You know, the, the job that I have mundanely, um, I wouldn't want to do it as a hobby. So I think I want to... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I think I want to try to keep blacksmithing as a hobby so I can continue loving it. How, how I mean, again, without putting too fine a point on it, how how user friendly is like startup costs? Uh, it's not user friendly at all. I think uh, I had yeah. help to buy my fir- first forge, and that was uh, probably about a thousand dollars or more. Uh, the anvil I just bought was, uh, I believe, five hundred dollars, maybe six hundred. So, and that's one hundred and seventy pounds um uh so the costs are up there um and that's that's not even including if you want like some of the more modern things like your own power hammer or um you know a a drill press or something um i i still do a lot of stuff by hand because i don't want to i one it's a space limitation because i'd have to start taking up more space and Mm -hmm. two is just money like i've already sunk this amount of money um i i try to 
I, I want to try to keep it to one major thing a year. <laughs> so my wife doesn't be like, what are you buying now? Uh, as I look over to the other room where she's in, where she's like, <laughs> like, what do you buy now? All right. So we um, only have a few minutes left. Believe it or not, we've 45 minutes have passed oh, so soon. Oh, so Lucas, do you have any other questions before we move on to the last one? No, we, question? we can move on. No, I, we All got right. to my list. So. Um, we, well, so I guess the other thing before we ask the last question is the only thing we didn't touch on was washing dishes. I, I, so I, we have a lot of friends out there who, who need volunteers and I'm, um, I, whenever, uh, so I guess more if, if you, if you need someone to help, I'm willing to help, <laughs> you know? So I, I've watched dishes at, at a few events. I've been a waiter whenever it's been needed um uh, uh long island the and up group and a uh in long island has a great event that's actually coming up again called uh, the feast of saint andrew and last year i went to go help out and i was a waiter um the last barley corn that we just had i was in the kitchen washing dishes the the morning that that sunday morning um i i think it's just important for everyone to help out in the back kitchens like i think it's good we're a volunteer organization everyone's volunteering their time and the idea that that um many hands make quick work helps everyone out and so i know it's it's hard especially like asking you know people who are already doing massive physical um uh uh uh, uh you know physical uh, uh uh doing fighting or something to maybe ask them to do a little bit more so i know that's rough but like doing a little bit just or everyone just pitching in to do a little bit helps out everyone at an event. And so um, and, and I'm in the middle of trying to organize our Broken Bridges, uh, Brooklyn's next event, which is Deck the Halls of Valhalla. So asking for volunteers and asking for help. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just gonna, yeah, it, it, it's a fun little event. Um, it's our Yule event uh, and uh, uh, just helping out and, and trying to, to, to be there for people when they need it. Nice. All right, last question, Lucas, I'll let you ask it. All right, so again, it's our typical question we end with. Um, in your experience over the last decade or so, um, what do you think we as a society can do better? I, I think the major thing that I really, and I want to focus on this, is to not forget what we've learned in the pandemic in the last years. That, you know, we've all kind of gotten the skill set of like, how can we do things differently? How do we keep the society that yes, is focused on history, but how do we cause it to grow and go to the future in a world that may not want to remember history? Um, and I think doing things like doing virtual events or going to events that are traditionally not something that the SCA would be a part of are what we can do to really help it grow. And while I love fighting and I think fighting should be really of the forefront, of really helping to build up the other um, areas of the SCA and really show off the other areas of the SCA to everyone who's not in the SCA will be a huge help because I think the lifeblood that we need is not just new fighters coming in, but new people who want to do fiber arts, new people who want to do scribal, new people who want to do uh, fencing, new people who just want to cook and hang out. And I think really showing off those things in both virtually and at weird events that we wouldn't be normally a part of is what's going to help us grow and get a richer, more fuller, more inclusive SEA that we're all happier with. Agreed. Yeah, wow. Amen. <laughs> all right, Lucas. Uh, what well, do you want to plug next week's guest since you know who it is? Uh... Ooh, I want to know. I don't remember we, her. As we her had name. somebody booked. Allison. I'll just say Allison. Allison from the East Kingdom. I don't remember her her SCA last name. I apologize. Um, but she's awesome and she's friends with me on Facebook. And I'm sorry, honey, that I don't remember your last name. But that's fine. So yeah. So we'll be Ragnar. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I think it was a, a wonderful talk. Awesome. Thank you for thank you for thank introducing you. us to something again in now in our third seat. We've never had really a blacksmith before um to, you know talking about the process and just just new things like this i think are really important for people to hear that there's there's there is something for everybody in the sca so um thank you so much for being with us tonight on behalf of my 
lovely co-host Sov and myself, Lucas. Uh, thank you, Skadians, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you so For much. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Simply Skadian. No title required.